Welcome, everybody. Hello and welcome. So amazing that you are all here. We are so nervous and happy and excited. So, my name is Ines Kappert. Together with Henning von Bagen, I'm the head of the Gunda Werner Institute for Feminism here in the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And together with my dear colleague um, Peggy Piesche, who is the referent in the Gunda Werner Institute. <laughs> Obviously, I don't have to present her any further. <laughs> and with Emilia Roik, who is also very well known and the head of the Center of Intersectional Justice. So all the three of us, we are so honored to welcome you to this feminist gala, which has the title, Happy Birthday, Intersectionality. <laughs> no matter if you are here in the big hall or if you are on the stairs outside or in one of the rooms where we're screening what's happening here on stage or at the live stream, please feel welcome. And we are convinced and we are sure we are going to have a splendid evening anyway. A big thank you already goes to the translators because they are... <laughs> they are already creating access, so thank you to the translators in the back, English, German, German, English. And thank you very much to the translators here in front who are translating everything into sign language. And of course, no surprise, we are so humbled to welcome our distinguished guest who just arrived from Los Angeles yesterday evening, who made it to be here with us, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. Yeah. Professor Kimberly Crenshaw is one of the most heard and influential activists, scholar, and feminists on the globe. And um, she teaches, teaches law at two universities in New York and in Los Angeles. And she founded, as many of you know already, the Afro-American Policy Forum, which is, as she is, in constant action to defend the rights of marginalized groups, especially of Afro-American women. And now she's, and now she's here. And, and allows us and gives us the occasion to celebrate the beauty and the glamour of outstanding feminists. Thank you. And thank you for coining a concept or for coining the concept of intersectionality that inspires so many people since 30 years. Now there's no one. <laughs> <laughs> to overcome intersectional discriminations, you have to get rid of what we are used to call the standard. We have to devaluate the standard because only then we are capable to stop to demonize differences and only then we are capable to acknowledge different lives, life realities in their complexities. What that means, ah, now I made a mistake. <laughs> what that means, 19 authors has, um, has written in, um, in an anthology we were just dedicating to Kimberly Crenshaw 
And um, I was supposed to have it in my hand. Hmm. I don't have it in my hand. So we have. To, so please, your imagination is um, is us. So it's very pink. Ah, yes, comes one. Perfect. Thank you. So in this anthology, the CIJ and the Gundavani Institute edited in honor of Glenn Marie Crenshaw. Um, 19 authors are telling what does it mean intersectionality personally for them. So we are very happy to have it here. It just arrived yesterday afternoon from the printing house, so it's all fresh, all warm, and uh, or still warm. And uh, we have prepared one edition for every one of you. It's waiting for you outside when you're going down after after the gala is taking place here. You're going down. <laughs> And you're very welcome to take one issue, either in German or in English. But this is future. Maybe you have noticed on your way up, just on the first floor, that we, are, we, are, um, we had three different ways to come up here. And that we have three different um, colors of signs, blue, yellow, and pink. So the first way we guided you through was over the stairs, very representative, very official. Um, the second, but yeah, but not everybody can do stairs. So the second goes with the elevator, which was marked blue. That might comes along with queuing up, takes longer, it's a different way. And the third way we marked with yellow signs were the fire steps. Very inconvenient, just concrete, very ugly green walls, no windows. So we did that because we might have even to come here on the first floor in Heinrich Böll Foundation, you might have had different experiences to get on the first floor. And that might inform in which room you can take your seat and which kind of seat you are taking. Because also, if you notice, we put different kind of chairs here in the room and some are more comfortable and some are less. So already to be seated is not the same for everyone. So now you can check on which, se <laughs> which, which chair you are, you are sitting. To overcome intersectional discrimination is not a humanitarian add-on. We all are convinced that it is the condition to defend democracy, and in order to defend democracy, we need to fully develop democracy, what we don't have yet. And this one occasion we will, we will see how much this is at urge are the upcoming European elections. And um, so we are into, yeah, we are just convinced and we dedicate all our work, each one of us, um, to push, to give a push to intersectional approaches, in fact, to intersectional feminism, because it must be pushed in Europe and for sure in Germany. And this is exactly what the Center of Intersectional Justice does. So today is a big day. We're celebrating 30 years of intersectionality, also here in Europe. And for the past 30 years, and even before the word was coined, there have been a lot of incredible feminists, intersectional feminists, women of color, trans people, refugees working towards more intersectional justice. But the thing is, they've been kept in the shadows, they've been kept in the background, and mainstream movements such as um, the feminist movement, the anti-racist movement, some, of, some parts of it, the disability rights movement, the climate justice movement, the LGBTQI movements have been reluctant to give space and share space and give power, share power. But power is rarely something that is given. It's something that is taken and that is created. And... <laughs> 
15 years ago, 15 years ago, it would have been unthinkable to have a gala celebrating a black woman on intersectionality. It would have been unthinkable. Also in such a big institution like the Heinrich Böll Stiftung. So let's celebrate the fact that we are here today. Um, and let's hope that, we'll, that there will be many more of such galas to come. And um, I want to say, like when I enter this room and seeing you all here really warms my heart. I see black women yeah. make some noise. Yeah. <laughs> I see women of color. I see trans people, gender non-conforming people. I see refugee women, members of the disability justice community. I see a lot of people who've been <laughs> invisible, and it's, it's a big day today to see you all here and to, to, yeah, to, to spend that time. So let's celebrate the fact that, let's celebrate our strength, our resilience, and the fact that we've made it so far. Let's, that we've carved out spaces of resistance, of solidarity, of love here in Europe too. And um, yeah, I want to say happy birthday intersectionality, but happy birthday to us too. Yeah. And in this sense, I want to give a shout out to all the amazing groups that are presented in the exhibition. I don't know if you've had a look already. So these are intersectional groups um, who've been really active in Berlin and beyond, and I want to name them. This is Las Migras. Yes. It's the QTB Park Festival. It's Adefra. It's um, the Trans Film Festival. Soul Sisters. The Moisi Collective of Paris. <laughs> but also Mwanamke, an Afro-feminist Afro Afro collective from Belgium. They're not represented here, but they're here in spirit. Um, and many more. So thank you all for the amazing work you do. And last but not least, I want to thank you, Kim, for, the for being the incredible source of inspiration that you are, the incredible source of love, and um, thank you for your generosity, for your trust, for your authenticity, and for being one of the reasons why a lot of us have found a home in social justice movements. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Happy birthday, intersectionality. Yeah, this is really this, exactly the spirit we are assembling here. I'm very honored to stay here tonight with my colleagues and you all after months of work and preparation and daring to think and go outside the box. We have started this on a warm summer day last year when we dis was deciding about the focus of this year's gala. And we were like, what if? What if we are bold? providing a platform for someone and something that made black collective life experience possible? What if we are focusing on a very tool, making it intelligible how the system creates voids to veil the power structures of white supremacy? What if we are celebrating a concept's life 30 years and counting, which is in this country still often being mistaken for a pure academic theory from the states. What if is what Afrofuturism is driven by, a collective resistance power to imagine and by that doing to create a better future for us. To center all of this means also to highlight and to emphasize the her stories and of the movements which pushed, furthered, and live every day intersectionality over all these past decades. And Amelia just highlighted them exactly. The, these are the organizations we are focusing on here tonight as well. When we celebrate tonight, we do so also with and for, and for the resistance powers of these collectives. It is good to know that there are forces to challenge the system. 
But it is also important to acknowledge the promise of inclusion we still have to come through with. While we are challenging the normative, we are also witnessing an almost run on the concept of internet, uh, intersectionality these days in progressive communities. This is, of course, due to the gaining strength of the global right. Thus, especially in these days, it's almost inevitable to understand that our political challenges to strive for a more inclusive society fundamentally needs an intersectional approach. Black queer feminist movements from Me Too to Trust Black Women have shown us the path of struggle. Intersectionality as a, as a traveling concept needs to connect with the needs, conditions, and structures of the respective contexts it is, it is applied to. We are confronted with this in our justice struggles from climate protection to the euphemism of population control. But let's not forget, forget white supremacy and its power dynamics of exclusion and oppression forces all of us to make exactly this political decision, that our feminism better be intersectional, or it's setting itself up for failure. <laughs> it is exactly in this spirit, it is exactly in this spirit that we are celebrating not only 30 years of intersectional, intersectionality, but also the audacity to imagine and to work for a better future for us. So once again, happy intersectionality, happy birthday to all of us. And now let's the party begin. So I want to introduce our MC for the evening. Who's Mayoa? Um, yeah. <laughs> so Mayoa is a stand-up comedian and the founder of Isa Comedy Show, Berlin's first comedy night highlighting the voices of POCs, people of color, and LGBTQI plus comedians. She's also a photographer, a filmmaker, a model, and an activist. All of this. And her documentary, Acting White, was part of the selection of the Berlin Feminist Film Week. And when she's not busy directing and uh, producing movies, um, she likes to record video for YouTube on her channel, Mayo's World, uh, which she uses to talk about body positivity, um, self-love, also freeform locks. Uh, if you haven't heard of the you know, topic of freeform locks, have a look. It's, um, it's worth it. Um, and also other topics. So go check the channel out. It's Mayo's World on YouTube. Um, Mayoa is also um, a, a German Chancellor Fellow and uh, currently Fellow at the Center for Intersectional Justice. So it's a great pleasure and an honor to have her with us at CIJ. And um, she, um, she likes to also do kickboxing uh, in her free time, five days a week, actually. So it's not free time, it's actually like a real committed practice. Um, yeah, so welcome, Mayoa. We're happy to um, have you. Uh, here for tonight as the MC of the ceremony. And also I want to say something about Maya, please come over here. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so it, it <laughs> 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 um, So I want to mention that this amazing outfit has been designed by um, Chaz Aracil. Yes! Who's here? So yes. you can stand up. up. Stand up. up. Here? Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to have such lit outfits and, you know, look, uh, you know, so amazing like this, you can go to, uh, you can go to chess for this. Mm. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Great. How are we doing, everybody? Good? Oh, my God. This is my first time having a clip mic. I feel like this is what, um, or if this is what Beyonce must feel like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh my God, so I'm so happy to see everybody here. This is gonna be a bomb, exciting event. I want you guys to like make noise and be loud and express yourself and like move how you wanna move. 
So the first way we're going to get it started is we're going to have a little runway show. I'm going to come right down the middle. So camera crew, make sure you got it all together. What y'all weren't expecting with this outfit is that this is a cape. And so she coming. She coming down. Yes. Yeah. Oh, she's twirling. Oh, you see here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Um, and I know there's like two or three other rooms, right, that have, that you, we can't see you guys, but I feel y'all. <laughs> I hope you guys are making noises in your other rooms. Did you? <laughs> Did you <win? laughs> All right. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm like, I'm the comedic relief, you know, so when I'm on stage, you guys can laugh. If it's not funny, just go ahead and laugh anyway, you know? But I wanna, get, you guys, where are we all from in the audience? It's exhausting the question. You're like, oh, my mom, me, my family, my lineage, right? Where, where, are, my, where are my Germans at? Wow, so, it's complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated, yeah. Okay, okay. Where are my German-speaking people at? Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. You guys, I'm trying, I've been trying really hard to learn the language. Wow, y'all's language. Wow, it's hard. It's hard. And I was living in Bonn for three months. Anyone from NRV yes. in here? Okay. Yes, fun area. Y'all turn, I love it. Anyway, I was living in Bonn for three months. I was taking German classes every day, six hours a day, for five days a week, and it was just, oh my God. It was intense. But I'm trying, I'm like, I wanna communicate better with people like y'all, who are German-speaking and fantastic. So I was trying to watch, you know, like different German TV shows to like get into it. So I watched RuPaul's Drag Race dubbed in German. <laughs> which <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen that, that is its own experience. And I don't know what's up with the dubbing industry here in Deutschland, but <laughs> I feel like they're not happy to come to work because when RuPaul came out, RuPaul was like, yes, I'm a real bitch, you know? And I was like, just don't translate it. Just let that, just let that sentence, but the next thing you hear, you say, hallo, ich bin ein echter Schlampe. <laughs> But I'm trying, I'm trying. I, I wanna, I actually wanna be, I wanna integrate, I wanna live here, I like being here, I like my friends, I like my community. I wanna be so German that I think paprika is spicy, right? The <laughs> fucking level of German that I'm trying to go for. <laughs> Almost died on the stage. Um, all right, so since we are in Germany, I wanna establish some rules. We gotta get the rules together. Um, first rule, I want you guys to be emotional and express all the emotions you feel. You know, don't hold back. If you wanna cry, let that tear go down. You know what I'm saying? People are looking at you crying, just be like, don't let me cry. You know, if you wanna cry in public, cry in public. If you, if you feel moved and you wanna, you know, put your hands up, put your hands up, clap, snap, ums, amens, hallelujahs. <laughs> Hallelujah, yes, we, all of that is acceptable if it's, I guess, appropriate to your culture. And, um, <laughs> 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 um, second rule, second rule always, I always say this, uh, do not touch people without their consent, always, doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying? Just, if you love what someone has on, do not put your hands on their body, because if you do it to me, you're gonna get pop popped. You know what I'm saying? Don't touch me, don't touch anyone, ask first, be like, is it cool? They'd be like, yeah, and then y'all do you, you know? Third rule, what's the third rule? When people are here, show them love. You know what I'm saying? People put all their stuff together. They got into all of their academia stuff for y'all. They want to have y'all feel it and pay attention and be respectful. And I feel like I have one more rule. Ooh, yes, this is a good one. Respect people's titles and pronouns. If someone is, you know what I'm saying? Like, if someone tells you this is my pronoun, you'd be like, yeah, bet, do it, right? And if someone says, I'm a professor or a doctor, this and this, and they emphasize that doctor part, you better call them by that doctor part. <laughs> Respect the fact that they went into student debt for y'all, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, so, with that being said, I am going to introduce, what if I had this note card and there was like nothing on it? I'm just look, trying to look smart. I'm gonna introduce uh, the, fe the first performer and, and like collective. His name is Ed Greva. Woo! 
And he's together with Sarah Mu Muvani. Ed is an activist, performer, and dedicated to the accessibility in queer spaces and LGBT acceptance within the disability rights movement. Yeah. Amongst others, Ed was involved in projects such as QueerBarrierFry.de from GLAD and Bestimmt Nicht, Forget Whatever You Believe to Know About Gender. Give it some love. Yeah. And Sarah Muwani is a black poet born, raised, and racialized in Leipzig. Anyone from Leipzig in here? No, just her. OK, yeah, just see who we are, all right. Lives and, and she lives and works in Berlin. As a black woman in Germany, her articles are situated within the Afro-German narrative. Characteristics for Sarah's work is the radical subjective of her texts. So I'm going to let them come on stage and show them some love, everybody. <laughs> Mayua, thank you for the nice introduction. Actually, we were kind of hoping we would just hear one sentence about ourselves. <laughs> and now we're like, oh, wow, you put in some effort to Google us, I guess. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Look what I found. They finally released a new issue of diversity today. It's only seven euros. Diversity today, I thought it was like three ninety nine or something. Yeah, well, I think capitalism won this one too. <laughs> I still thought it was worth it for once. Let's yes. see what's in there. <clears throat> the ongoing social justice war reached a new level of intensity when the Intersectional Business Foundation announced they wouldn't be hiring any more disabled people of color for their intersectional startup on accessibility solutions. They claimed that they have had very bad experiences with their previous employees, who had all proved to be too biased to make any rational decision. <laughs> They're very uncompromising, emotionally intense, and very unpractical approach to accessibility issues within the IBF made it especially very difficult for the team to act as a united front in the fight for accessibility for all. The speaker therefore announced that they would continue to build a diverse and intersectional team by focusing on hiring other identities. When asked how the IBF would intend to treat applications of queer people of color with disabilities, the speaker refused to answer specifically. He stated instead that those individual cases would have to be handled with extra care and sensitivity. The Intersectional Business Foundation aims to support and fund upcoming intersectional entrepreneurs with their unique, diverse business ideas. It believes it is possible to create both profitable business startups and stay true to values of social responsibility. I mean, I don't even know what to say. I mean, this is just so... I'm really sorry. I think you want to apply to exactly this... Yeah, well, Institute. guess that's off the table now. <laughs> I don't know. I'm really sorry, but is there something else in the job department or something? Yeah, let's see, here, job section. Oh, there's something from the Institute of Germany, Reunited, Never Divided. Wow. <laughs> Listen, the executive board of the Center of Germany, Reunited, Never Divided, 
short CFR and da 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 has decided to immediately cancel all funding programs for research on black and queer identity in Eastern Germany. Wow, fuck. This decision was made with deep regret, but was deemed to be however necessary to remain competitive face with other research institutions. The CFNDG considers migration by people from Central African descent from the so-called socialistischen Bruderstaaten to be an interesting but very marginal side issue. The same can be said about their children and grandchildren's living situation. This among other things due to the fact that languages such as French, Lingala, or the Saxonian dialect <laughs> I mean, are not wow. as compatible in fruitful international debates compared to the US American English or possibly British English. Such publications are nevertheless very relevant and valuable for the French speaking, for the Cuban, for the East German, and for the audiences from the former German colonies, but would not, ha would not have much impact outside of those boxes. Wow. Really, those boxes? Okay, on a positive note, the budget rearrangement will enable us to increase our fundings for long-standing projects. The CFNDG will start a movement that will unite everyone in their understanding of queer and black as a worldwide uniform concept. We especially welcome any scholarly contribution concerning new phenomena, such as migration to Germany. A new phenomena? The National Socialism. We particularly welcome any contribution with a clear reference to the works of Audre Lord or at least Angela Davis. <laughs> wow, they really put some thought into that. Holy crap. Uh, that, wasn't that exactly what you wanted to do your PhD on? Like black and queer identities in Eastern Germany? Where are you going to get your scholarship funding now? And where is all this coming from in the first place? I mean, do you remember two weeks ago? It was just two weeks ago we were sitting here celebrating these new opportunities, yeah. these new intersectional opportunities. And now this is a backlash? Is it called backlash? I guess that's what yeah. they call it, yeah. Fuck. Huh. But at least you speak proper English, huh? <coughs> and at least your German has no Saxonian dialect. <laughs> I think you would be the perfect face for Germany reunited, never divided, as a new uh, phenomena. <laughs> Well, I mean, you have all the soft skills and patience and you're always so calm in a debate. I bet the IBF would immediately hire you to go on the accessibility team and welcome your unbiased diplomatic way of finding solutions. I, you know what? I think you just have some representation envy issues. Some, oh, and you don't. Yeah, it's <laughs> representation envy. Look what they made us feel. Wow. But I think it would work. I think it would really work. I mean, really, if we both just would apply for each other, I think we would have money in the end of this month. <laughs> ah. So you mean like I take your research application do some stuff related to Angela Davis and you apply for the accessibility project and find some practical solutions? I think this is kind of ridiculous and a little bit absurd. Absolutely. But I would rather have you there than, I mean, imagine Hildegard <laughs> would get this place, or imagine <laughs> even Carsten would get our position. <laughs> I mean, this is not oh, possible. Oh yeah, well, fair this, enough. <laughs> this cannot please, no? Uh -huh. Can't wait to read that PhD then, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs>
I think we can even just switch application. We don't even have to put in some extra effort. We just take our applications and switch it because I can also think resourceful and efficient. Oh, yeah. I mean, we could just, you know, make a comedy sketch out of the results. Yeah. <laughs> If they take us, I think we could make a comedy out of it or boycott it. Or we take the jobs. <laughs> I think I would take this risk. I think I would really take this bet if you are my choker. Well, do you? <laughs> Thank you. There it is. Okay, give it up again for the comedy duo. That was good. <laughs> She's great. Um, okay, so uh, also I just want to say that if you guys pronounce someone's name wrong, don't look awkward about it. Just try to get it right, right? So I'm saying that because my name is Mayo Ashinubi, who all has names that people just butcher all types of everybody in this room, yeah, all of us. So if I, so if to any of the performers, if I say anything wrong, if I don't pronounce it right, just tell me and I'll try and correct it or, or correct it yourself when y'all get on stage. Um, so the next person who I am uh, introducing to the stage, her name is Afra Jechi. Is that Jechi? You'll do it, all right. She's, <laughs> sorry, I tried. She's a lawyer, mother, and activist in the African community here in Germany, and she's based in Hamburg. And you moved to Hamburg when you were 12, right? Yeah, who else is from Hamburg in here? Yes, expensive city, y'all, but it's so expensive, oh my god. But anyway, okay, welcome to the stage, Afra. Mm -hmm. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. I'm so honored to be here this evening. Let me pick this, right? I don't want to break my leg. So, Professor Crenshaw, you can't imagine how happy I am to stand here today. Of course, we are colleagues. But let me greet the others first. <laughs> so, I heard hamburgers. Wonderful, hi. Anybody from Ghana? Great, so good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I was supposed to have a free mic, so when I switch, you trim me back here again. I'm so happy to be here because when Peggy asked me to speak, initially I was like, are you sure? Then initially I got excited and started telling all my friends and family, just guess who's speaking where. And of course, uh, their reaction wasn't really what I had expected, because they go like, uh, how did you get there? I mean, you were just a lawyer for shipping and tax, and we, I mean, we have been researching her work for many years. Oh my goodness, do you know what to talk about? And I was like, okay, yeah, somehow right. And of course, I'm not here to misrepresent my husband or my family and friends because they're right. I'm not here to speak about your great work on intersectionality because today I stand here to represent a standard. A standard, I call it the only onesies, a black spot on a white printing paper. And I'm not talking about those, um, how should I call it, the gray, scratchy, recycled, Paper, no. I'm talking about those white, 
political incorrect. You should be ashamed of yourself. Paper that we all hide and print on, but we still use somehow. Because that black sport, our mayor presence is so loud, but you don't hear us. Look, I mean, you said Hamburg, right? I went to a bilingual school there, UNESCO school, popular, only black girl in that school, visible, yet not heard, seen. Everybody was like, she, she's good in math. She's good in running. She beats the boys. And of course, they will be always seeing me. I'll go to classes, speak to them about the UNESCO concept of sharing. Then suddenly, I spotted them. The little onesies, first class, second class. I used to whisper to the class, but to them, I screamed because their eyes looked at me. The only onesies, black sports on white printing papers. Yes, I said it. Today I'm here to represent a standard. You know, I'm a mother of an, of an adorable nine-year-old, and I'm very happy that he's not here with us today because that age is like, do you really have to talk to them about me? Why did you say that? But he and I had an experience I really want to share with you tonight. At that age, kids makes you watch these really extremely interesting animal stories. <laughs> He's not here, I can say that. You're not telling, right? <laughs> so there's one particular one he made me watch, and since then I'm really interested in these animal movies, and I'm going to share with you because I brought it with me. It fits in our intersectional move and thoughts. It is about a brown bear and bees, and I'm just going to dive into it, right? I don't want to bore you with all the starting. My nine-year-old next to me on the sofa, Saturday afternoon, he chooses that film. A brown bear walking in the woods, spots a tree. I'm like, huh? He walks right to the tree, hit on the tree, start working himself through that tree, and sadly I knew what was there. The bees came out, flipping, fighting, second, First, second, and third infantry, they were so active, battling the bear, but the bear, pff, not bothered at all, works himself through, and then, at last, he got the honey. My nine-year-old was chill looking the film, but I was thrilled. I mean, how did that bear know what to do when? At that moment, that diminished in straightforwardness, I was, I was really freaking out. You know, I said, colleagues, as a lawyer, university, Potsdam, Potsdam in the room? Okay, you know that city. <laughs> Campus Faculty of Law, only black student. I was, how should I say it? I was intimidated about the masses around me. I mean, for the first exam, you know it, Professor Cranshaw, in law, that period shortly before the exam, the most important period is not which books to read, which courses to take, or let me say it, with quotations to cite at the right time. No, you need some free state of mind to be able to excel, to perform at your best, to be amazing, to be distinctively unique in that exam. But how do I get that free state of mind? I mean, what type of information do I need? We all know it. You in the room, I look at you, look around you. The real catalyst of normality is that, that access to information, to know who you are. I mean, me, who am I? Bee or bear, or how do I get the honey? As I said, today I stand here to represent a standard. Do you know those skywalkers, that tightrope they walk on? Who are we? Are we the rope? Are we the guys standing there walking? You know, when I graduated, time to impress, a job interview. But the question is, um, have you an idea how to get the information you need to get the job, you need to exhale, to be undiminishedly perform, that they would just like, I need you in that desk to wear that black robe. In German, we don't have that then on the head, you know. 
we just go like that with a black rope. I wanted that. But then, how do I get the information? You see me with this thing, digitalization, I'm all into it, so I Googled. How to impress at a job interview as being me, hashtag black, law student, hashtag black or African woman, me in Germany, how do I get that? When in that corporate world, the only women that look like me are those ladies pushing that trolleys from toilet to toilet. How does such a society picture my uniqueness of oneness with this quest for high performance? How do they see me as an asset to invest in? Me with my oneness, my only oneness with my little only onesies. Then, today, the only onesies around me, after me, you've seen them. They are what? Irreversibly visible in the world with a voice. Because today, they're doctors, they're bankers, they're linguists, they're artists. Of course, there she is, gender study specialist for the Western African, I see her. They are there. We are now there, an asset to invest in. How do we get there? Thank you, Professor Crenshaw. Because with your intersectionality, you've given us a tool to picture the only onesies as an asset to invest in. And to you all investment managers out there, I call on you. Invest in them, appraise them. Look around you, they are among us. Thank you. Give it up again for Afra. Okay. So how are we how are we doing in rooms two and three, y'all? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Good. Good. So we're still we have the energy up, right? We're still feeling excited. When I say hey, 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 y'all say ho, ho, ho. Hey, hey, hey. Ho. Who are you calling a ho? Hey. Just kidding. So just kidding. All right. Um, 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 um. So, okay. I'm, I'm loving. So, Ghanaians are in the crowd. I'm Nigerian. Anyone else Nigerian? Yes. And um, where are my Africans? Yes. Wakanda forever, right? It's always appropriate. You can always use this. Um, okay. So, we have one last power speaker. And then, well, I'm going to keep you guys surprised. So, I'm, we have one last power speaker. And then we have some other fantastic amazing things going on. Her name is Shermeen Langhoff. Did I say that right? And yes. Since 2013, Shermeen is the director of the Maxim Gorky Theater in Berlin, one of Berlin state theaters which focus on the examination and construction of nation, identity, and belonging. She also coined the term post-migrant theater. In her time as a director, the Maxim Gorky Theater has been awarded twice as best theater in Germany. Yes. <laughs> All right, welcome her to the stage. Uh, <laughs> allow me, please, excuse Professor Crenshaw, especially um, apologize to you. I'm going to wear glasses <laughs> as long as my eyes are not the best anymore, and I hope I can hold the minutes that I have. Uh, first of all, thank you. Um, to the people who organized this. I mean, we had you here, Emilia Roy, Ines Kappert, Peggy Pische, and everybody who organized it. Thank you so much. We brauchen kein Mitleid. Wir brauchen Allianzen. Wir brauchen einen umfassenden, sehr viele und mehrere Kategorien berücksichtigen Identität, berücksichtigenden Identitätsbegriff. Do you have a translation? Wir brauchen Solidarität, wir brauchen Aufmerksamkeit, wir brauchen Transparenz, wir brauchen Geld, wir brauchen Rechte, wir brauchen Zugänge, 
Wir brauchen keine Helden, aber Vorbilder. Vorbilder, wie Sie eine sind, sehr verehrte Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. Wenn ich voller Bewunderung und Dankbarkeit an Kimberly Crenshaw und ihr Werk denke, höre ich eben eine innere Stimme, die diese Forderungen stellt. Forderungen, die auch ich als meinen Auftrag erkenne und die mir Kraft geben, meine Arbeit fortzusetzen. Die ich nach zwei Dekaden vom politischen Aktivismus, in den ich hineingeboren wurde und einer Dekade, in der ich Filme produzierte, vor über einem Jahrzehnt mit dem postmigrantischen Theater in Berlin begonnen habe. In Bezug auf meine Kontexte, nämlich dem postmigrantischen Theater, haben wir versucht, vielfältige Lebens Lebenswirklichkeiten und Biografien in den deutschen Kanon einzubeziehen. In Bezug aber auf meine Kontexte, nämlich die deutsche Theaterwelt, muss ich gestehen, das Projekt von globaler Gerechtigkeit ist nicht nur am Anfang, sondern nicht mal am Horizont zu sehen. In diesen Narrativen, die nicht repräsentiert wurden und den neuen Narrativen, die wir geschafft haben, haben wir Intersektionalität als eine kritische Praxis begriffen, neben der gefassten Erfahrung, die man mit den Jahren mitbringt. Ein Prozess, der aber bereits zu vielen Missverständnissen geführt hat. Missverständnisse, die sich unter einem Diversity-Begriff subsimieren, der nur Inklusion meint, Antirassismus ausschließlich als ein Problem der Repräsentation begreift, anstatt Rassismus als Ergebnis, als Ergebnis von Prozessen, von Rassifizierungsprozessen, die strukturell sind, offenzulegen. The master's tool, tools will never dismantle the master's house, schrieb Audrey Lord. Diversity fördert zwar progressive Werte, ändert aber eben nicht zwangsläufig ein mehrdimensionales ökonomisches und politisches System. Der Aufbau... Der Aufbau diverserer Teams und Vorstände setzt ohne Zweifel gesellschaftliche Dynamiken frei, von denen nicht nur Angehörige bestimmter Gruppen profitieren. Nichtsdestotrotz laufen auch wir immer wieder Gefahr, innerhalb eines neoliberalen Rahmens zu verharren, der die Komplexität des Zusammen- und Wechselwirkens von den Diskriminierungsachsen Race, Class, Gender nicht nur nicht erfassen kann, sondern geradezu ausblenden muss. Muss, um sich selbst zu erhalten. Gleichzeitig erleben wir einen Backlash, die Kollegen sagten es schon, der nicht nur progressive Werte, sondern gelebte Realitäten bis hin zu fünf Millionen Bürgern muslimischer Herkunft und ihre Existenz in Frage stellt und damit Demokratie an sich. Und dieser reaktionäre Backlash kommt nicht etwa nur vom rechten Rand, sondern aus der Mitte der Gesellschaft. Als, The Als Theaterfrau bedeutet das, heute unter anderem sich vorwerfen zu lassen, Sprachkontrolle und Moralpolitik zu betreiben, sowie hypersensiblen, beleidigten Minderheiten eine Bühne dafür zu bieten, ihre Kränkungen als politische Waffe einzusetzen. Alles Zitate in der vergangenen Woche im Spiegel von einem Kollegen Stegemann. Berlin Mitte im Jahr 2019 und wir reden immer noch darüber, ob weiße Schauspieler schwarze Figuren auf eine Weise präsentieren, repräsentieren dürfen, die einen an nichts anderes als die rassistische Tradition der Minstrels-Shows denken lassen kann. Die Berliner... Die Berliner Kollegen scheinen andere Umgänge mit der Repräsentation schwarzer Menschen auf deutschen Bühnen als eine Einschränkung ihrer künstlerischen Freiheit oder gar Zensur zu betrachten. Erstaunlich ist daran, wie stark der Vorwurf greift, es ginge in diesen künstlerischen Fragen lediglich um beleidigte Gefühle marginalisierter Gruppen. Der Vorwurf lautet dann, es gehe um übertriebene Partikularinteressen, die die alles entscheidende Frage jene nach der Klasse nicht stellten und damit den Hauptwiderspruch im marxistischen Sinne außer Acht ließen. 
Neben der Tatsache, dass ich Jahrzehnte in meinem jungen Leben genau auf diese kommunistischen Männer hörte und wartete, dass die Nebenwidersprüche gelöst werden mit dem Hauptwiderspruch, So erklärt auch dieser Berliner Dramaturg und Autor Herr Stegemann im Spiegel, wenn der Fleischzerleger, ich zitiere, in einer Großschlachterei für einen minimalen Lohn arbeitet, dann ist das für jeden erkennbar Ausbeutung. Was eine Kränkung ist, liegt dagegen im Auge des Betrachters, Zitat Ende. Der Fleischzerleger, meine Lieben, ist ohne Zweifel ein leidtragender struktureller Diskriminierung. Die rassistisch repräsentierte Person ist in dem Fall aber lediglich gekränkt. Sie hat verletzte Gefühle und das ist subjektiv. Laut Stegemann liegt Rassismus im Auge des Betrachters. Sexismus und Ableismus, wie er weiter ausführt, übrigens auch. Als ob ökonomische Verhältnisse nur in der Diskriminierungserfahrung eines weißen, männlichen Arbeiters effektvoll gesetzt in den martialistischen Schlachthof eine Rolle spielen könnten. Hier zeigt sich eindrücklich, was weit über unsere Szene hinausgeht, wie weit wir nämlich davon entfernt sind, das Patriarchat, den Kapitalismus und den Rassismus als miteinander verwobene Hierarchien und Herrschaftssysteme anzuerkennen und wie groß die Angst ist, die eigenen Privilegien, die Deutungshochheit, die kulturelle Hegemonie zu verlieren, auch um den Preis der völligen Entsolidarisierung einer Gesellschaft, um jeden Preis, wie es aussieht. Vor lauter gekränkten Gefühlen, die einen weißen, männlichen Protagonisten der deutschen Hochkultur, wie ihr ihn auch gegenüber im ehrenwerten deutschen Theater finden könnt, der es mit dem größten Budget bis heute nicht geschafft hat, eine schwarze Kollegin oder einen Kollegen auf seiner Bühne zu haben, geschweige denn darüber hinausgehende Dinge äh, zu machen. Aber vor lauter ge gekränkten Gefühlen sind also diese extrem bedrohten Opfer der Hochkultur von der sogenannten PC-Hysterie die geraten sozusagen auf einmal in einen Mittelpunkt und die nicht affektiven Komponenten geraten in den Hintergrund. Es geht nämlich nicht um, um sie und um ihre Opfersituation. Es geht um uns, es geht um Ressourcen, es geht um Zugänge, es geht um Rechte in all diesen Kämpfen. Denn wenn wir über ein sich im Neoliberalismus gefallenes Diversity-Konzept hinauskommen wollen, müssen wir alle und all jene äh, Ausschlüsse aufspüren, selbstkritisch bleiben, gerade in den Institutionen, in denen wir natürlich immer noch reproduzieren, auch in solchen selbstkritischen wie unseren. Wir müssen jene Ausschlüsse aufspüren, sichtbar machen, und, um ihre Verwicklungen zu verstehen und schließlich zu überwinden. Vor 30 Jahren begann Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, Generationen von Intersectional Justice-Kämpferinnen zu prägen, indem sie mit dem Modell der Intersektionalität als Kreuzungssystem die Entrechtlichung und Schutzlosigkeit von mehrfach diskriminierten Gruppen sichtbar und besprechbar machte. In diesem komplexen System also kreuzen sich die verschiedenen Diskriminierungsachsen nicht nur, sie wirken reziprok. Wenn wir über Gerechtigkeit sprechen, so sagt sie, müssen wir also über Recht sprechen. Das unterscheidet eine bequeme Diversity, die sich in der Auswahl einzelner Token-Ausnahmen gefällt, von einem Umdenken des Rechts an sich. Ich bin zwar die erste Intendantin sogenannter türkischer Herkunft in einem Land, in dem aber die meisten der ersten Generation türkischer und kurdischer Einwanderer aus den 60ern und 70ern, wie auch meine Mutter, nicht einmal ein kommunales Wahlrecht haben 2019. Obgleich sie... Obgleich sie Jahrzehnte in Fabriken gearbeitet und Steuern gezahlt haben. Und wieder zeigt sich, there is no thing as a single issue struggle. 
because we do not live single-issue lives. Wieder ein Zitat von Audrey Lord, ausgesucht vom Nachwuchs des Gorki, meiner jungen Kollegin Rebecca Einwoiner. Rebecca, bitte einmal aufstehen. Die im Gegensatz... Die im Gegensatz zu mir die Intersektionalität neben gefasster Erfahrung auch studiert hat und mich heute unterstützt hat, damit ich mich traue, vor Ihnen zu sprechen. <lacht> Zitate einer wichtigen Autorin, die auch meine Tochter Rosa Langhoff, 20 Jahre alt, auch ich möchte als Mutter sprechen, begeistert liest. Rosa verdankt ihren Namen Rosa Parks und Rosa Luxemburg. Sie ist an einem 5. Dezember geboren. An einem 5. Dezember begann auch der Montgomery-Boykott. Wenige Tage nachdem Rosa Parks friedlichen Widerstand geleistet hatte. Es ist der Tag, an dem Martin Luther King die Projektkoordination dieses Boykotts übernommen hat. Und Rosa Parks und Martin Luther King haben gekämpft, ohne alle Früchte ihres Kampfes während ihrer Lebzeiten zu sehen. Auch für die Rosas und die Rebekkas heute, zu deren Vorbildern auch Sie gehören, liebe verehrte Kimberly Crenshaw. Schönst deshalb, dass es Sie gibt und Ihr Werk, schönst, dass es euch alle gibt. Es war vom ersten Moment an heute Empowerment, als man hier reinkam. Wir werden, wie die Generationen vor uns, weiterkämpfen müssen, nicht nur für uns, sondern auch für die kommenden Generationen. Aber jetzt und heute haben wir vor allem Grund zu feiern. Happy Birthday, Intersectionality! Um, give it up again, everybody. Okay, so we have one more. We have like a lit performance. I want to see what you guys are playing. Okay, I don't read music, so I don't know what that is. Um, but we have we have a classical. We're gonna have classical music in here, but it's gonna be to some like lit music that we actually want to listen to. Um, that was <laughs> the <laughs> the group that we're having is called the String Orchestra. Yeah? Good. Do y'all know of them? They were founded in 2016 to empower ethnic minority musicians in classical music and give remembrance to the composers who have been erased from music history because of their ethnic background. So y'all can come to the stage. Yes. Yes. Violins, viol violas. Viola, cellos, yeah! Oh, they look cute! Yeah. Yes!
Give it up again for the string orchestra. Yo. That was real beautiful. Even when you guys were like just getting in tune, I was like, soul, take my money. It's amazing. Oh my God. It's like, it's like, you know when you have a lot of different perfumes that you smelled, great perfumes, and then you smell the coffee? That's what that was, right? Like just <laughs> soothing the mind. Okay, so we had, well, I'm trying to think, how am I going to transition? Um, where, <laughs> where are my Americans at, actually? Yes, the loudest. I love it. Is anyone, is anyone from Atlanta? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, the loudest, really. Okay, I'm from, I'm from Atlanta, and um, I've been in Europe for five years. I came when I was 21, and the first time I had ever seen a train was in Europe, or like a, a bus or anything, so I never took public transportation in Atlanta from the suburbs. And so anyway, I didn't know that y'all had like bus stops. Like, so I only saw it in movies. So the whole time I was just like, excuse me? I was like, these Europeans are so rude. And then he wound down the window. And he goes, no, you have to go to a bus stop. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I've been at bus stops ever since. Haven't gone back. Um, with that being said, okay, so when I, okay, hey, hey, hey. Oh. Are you guys excited for like the grand finale? Yeah. Something good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm really excited that Professor Kimberly Crenshaw is gonna come up here and speak. I remember my homegirl in Atlanta first sent me her your work and she was like, you gotta check her out, she's the truth. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I read it ever since then, it was the truth. And I really appreciate the work that you've done because you've created space for us to be seen and to be heard. And like, honestly, you're revolutionary, you're iconic, iconic from academic point, but also like a fashion icon, low key, yes. She is, she is. Everybody, welcome to the stage, Kimberly, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. Thank you. to say. I am so, so, uh, first of all, just grateful. Um, I'm going to try to hold it together, y'all. Um, so um, when Emilia um, contacted me uh, and asked me to come, I have to say that because I know Emilia, she was um, a student of mine at Columbia, I was willing to put aside a bad memory I have of the last time I came to something called Celebrating Intersectionality. Yeah. The last time I came to something called Celebrating Intersectionality, between the time I was invited and the time I arrived, the title had acquired a question mark after it. As in Celebrating Intersectionality, <laughs> right? Um, and I literally gave a speech with a question mark over my head. So, you know, I've sort of like not done that kind of thing uh, again, um, but uh, anything Amelia tells me to do, I do, uh, in, in, including um, giving me the honor of being the president of CIJ, and I couldn't be more proud of it, of her, and more thankful that she gave me the opportunity to be in this wonderful space. So first of all, thank you, Amelia. Of course, I want to thank uh, Inez, Hannah, and Peggy for hosting this amazing event, um, for lifting up intersectionality, for supporting CIJ, and supporting all of us who benefit from the wonderful work um, that CIJ does. I'm very, very proud to, to know uh, of the um, Heinrich Boll Foundation. Thank you for your gracious uh, coordination and for your amazing hospitality. It's just been wonderful to be here. 48 hours, I'm in and out, but it's been the best 48 hours that I've had in a very long time. So thank you so much. 
Um, so I explained to my law students when I ran out of class uh, Friday um, that, uh, yes, I was going to Berlin for 48 hours and no classes are not canceled next week, <laughs> um, that this was a very important event um, to um, uh, share some ideas about intersectionality after 30 years. Now, I have to tell you, I've been desperately trying to narrow down all that's in my heart to share in the time I have, and, and more has been loaded into my heart since I've been here. And I do um, want to say how uh, moved I've been by the comedy, um, the performances, um, the, the, the comedy again, and the music, I have to tell you, my mother was a musician for 50 years. Um, she played the organ, the trombone, the violin. Um, my father was a musician as well. That's how they came together. I think the hope was that somehow the genes would take over um, and I would be able to do maybe one of those things. I cannot sing. I cannot play the trombone. I tried to do the violin, and what I really liked about the violin, and, and they did it well, that look that you get when you're getting it, like... <laughs> it, it looks like it feels sublime to like be able to do this and make that kind of music. The only thing I could do was get the look, but the music didn't sound anything like that. So they, they, took, the, they took the violin away from me and, um, and told me not to sing. Um, and so what my mom used to always say to me is like, baby, that's okay, you can talk. <laughs> I was like, Mom, I ain't gonna make a career out of talking. <laughs> so I wish she was here, um, both to see this a beautiful, beautiful performance and basically to say, to see that, hey, yeah, Mom, I kept talking. Um, and I've been talking for about uh, 30 years. So what to talk to you about? So in the last two years alone, the trajectory of intersectionality has just been surprising. It has um, been taken up everywhere across the globe. Um, thank you so much. Now, a colleague of mine, when I told him I didn't know what to talk about, um, his, his, his advice was, just go and take a victory lap, right? <laughs> Now, aside from the fact that ain't me, um, it would just be false and disconcerting to take a victory lap with respect to anything regarding social justice these days, um, particularly in light of some of the shocking and, and truly frightening events that have occurred. Um, we could just be here all night if we just listed all the things that have occurred, much less actually talking about them. So let me just you know, throw out some places and we'll get a sense of what I mean. Sri Lanka, New Zealand, Charleston, Pittsburgh, Paris, Syria, Manchester, Orlando, Parkland, South Sudan. All of these places symbolize sites of hatred, carnage, and violence, rather than places where people live out their lives in peace. In this rapidly deteriorating political environment, new and old democracies have been destabilized by people who've cynically used primitive ideas to demarcate who belongs and who is an interloper, who is virtuous and who is a contaminant, who must rule and who must follow. These tragedies should reveal to us how insanely naive it was that claims of post-racialism or post-feminism or post-anything were ripe, ever. And, and all of this is before we even get to intersectionality. So I think many of this room probably relate intersectionality to the current crisis as a cautionary reminder that as we move against the societal legacies of genocide, racism, patriarchy, imperialism, all of the isms that we are inheriting right now, we have to do so with an attentiveness to their dimensions, the interrelated dynamics that allow them to reconstitute themselves anew in every generation. Yet what I'm most troubled about is some of the competing interpretations that have tamed, distorted, and even blamed intersectionality for the rise of the political right and the violence that has accompanied it. Now, I want to I want to think a minute about the irony in this blaming that bespeaks the appeal of intersectionality even among those who long to defeat it. 
So in a fascinating twist, critics from the right, and I want to call them the anti-intersectional intersectionalists, <laughs> they're increasingly using intersectionality to advance their own bold performance of race and gender grievance, even as they critique identity politics. So for example, a recent video complains that intersectionality is a ranking system that defines cisgender straight white men as the newly disempowered pariah class, whose opinions, we're told, sadly, no longer matter. <laughs> now, I have to say <laughs> that I had personally assumed that no idea like this would actually travel. It couldn't hold any water long enough to do any damage in respectable political discourses. But then I watched Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina channel precisely this claim in the stately halls of the American Senate in the aftermath of the Kavanaugh hearings as he shouted as follows. I know I'm a single white male from South Carolina, and I'm told I should shut up, but I will not shut up. And he goes on and on. Now, strange things happen in rooms that are occupied by powerful people whose lives are largely untouched by the dynamics that trouble and interrupt and even destroy lives of the dispossessed. So while the actions of these elites might differ across nations in terms of their specifics, one common move can be seen globally, and that is the desire to solve societal problems by gentrifying its rhetorics or completely erasing the problem altogether. So concepts like intersectionality articulated by marginalized people to draw attention to illegitimate power are weaponized by the elite to silence our voices. <laughs> Problems are purportedly solved by severing the rhetorical tongues of those who would denounce the realities in which marginalized people live. Allies will stand by or even enable this muting so long as their own interests are being served. Thus, in the United States, for example, Graham replaces the grievance of racialized others with complaints of straight white men like himself. Elsewhere, and I say this guardedly, I'll just leave it at that, anti-racism is delegitimized by assuming that the fiction of race extends to the reality of racism. As if there's some magic in the belief that if we don't see it, if we don't hear it, if we don't speak it, if we don't see, hear, and speak the evil of racism, there won't be any evil of racism. Now, we tried that once in the United States. It was called post-racialism. Eight years later, we got Donald Trump. And recall it was his very fine people who marched with torches cha challenging and chanting, Jews will not replace us. So we lost a lot of traction pretending that racism doesn't exist, that doing away with race erases the centuries of power through which this concept has metastasized across all of our societies. And when feminists accept the articulation of gender without a corresponding acknowledgement of race, their allyship with women of color is fundamentally compromised, if not altogether destroyed. <laughs> now, some moderates and liberals have cast this frightening development as a casualty of what they call identity politics. For example, I have a colleague at Columbia, Mark Leela, whose response to the 2016 election seems to suggest that it wasn't patriarchy, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, white supremacy that underwrote the backlash to Obama. Instead, he said, the blame rests on paying too much attention to the issues that divide us. Now, at bottom, there seems to be a nostalgia for the good old days when national identities held us together in the pursuit of a more perfect union. 
And since the critics' understanding of intersectionality is that it is identity politics run amok, the mothership of all identity politics, then dismantling intersectionality is an urgent route towards arriving at a simpler, more comforting understanding of the world that we have now inherited. Now, I have sometimes been called upon to account for all the mischief that intersectionality purportedly creates. An example of this is when a publication that's de dedicated to exploring new ideas called to interview me last year about intersectionality. Of course, as far as breaking news is concerned, they were about 30 years too late. <laughs> but nonetheless, in my naivete, I thought that the intersectionality wars that this publication was calling me to talk about might refer to any number of ways that particular populations fell through cracks of conventional politics. But I soon found out that the intersectionality wars were not anything like I thought. So the intersectionality wars that this publication wanted to report about was not about, say, the struggle to elevate and address state violence against black women, as our Say Her Name campaign has done, seeking to elevate the fact that in the United States, black girls as young as seven, black women as old as 95 have been killed by the police. 60% of the black women killed by the police were unarmed at the time that they were killed, making them the only race gender group to have had a majority of their members unarmed when they were killed. No, the intersectionality wars was not about that. It wasn't also about violence against women of color. It wasn't about sexual uh, abuse, police sexual abuse of women who are poor or trans or homeless or chemically dependent or involved in sex work. Although sexual violence is the second most common complaint against police officers, the war wasn't about that either nor about the Oklahoma City police officer who was convicted of raping eight black women two years ago. The story wasn't about the specific ways that the war on immigration overlooked consequences of status insecurity for immigrant and refugee women and girls, making them more vulnerable to domestic abuse as well as to rape and harassment by their employers, a truly global phenomenon. Nope wasn't about that, nor was it about the astronomical rates of sexual violence and murder faced by indigenous women in North America, or about the invisibilized double discrimination that Dalit women in South Asia face as subjects of both casteism and sexism. It wasn't about how the mainstreaming of marriage equality through the couple next door framework left out millions of queer people who aren't just like us, and about how the billions of people most likely to suffer from the immediate impact of global warming are least likely to shape the movement against it. No, the intersectional wars were not about any of those issues. It turned out that intersectionality itself was the thing that was being interrogated and intercepted, asked to justify itself as an interloper in the gated community of established and legitimate ideas. Now, for those of you who are waiting on the edge of your seats for a response to all of this, I have to manage your expectations. Over the years, I've argued that we can learn much more about intersectionality by understanding intersectionality not as a thing that can be defined or abstract concept or a list of all the intersectionalities that matters. One time I was here in Frankfurt and that was like the big debate, like how many intersections are there in the abstract? How can you talk about that without knowing what issue you're talking about, right? So, I see intersectionality not as a thing, but as a way of seeing, a way of thinking, a way of doing, a way of talking back to the limited conceptions of social power that have constrained our ability to take meaningful, transformative action for generations. Intersectionality. From its, from its inception was articulated to capture law's refusal to see compound discrimination. It was offered as a word picture to make clear what the law apparently couldn't see. 
Now, it has since come to be identified in relationship to many things, which it is, and at the same time, it's not just about those things. So, intersectionality is indeed about identity, but not only about identity. It's a product of black feminist thinking, but it's not only about black women. It reflects encounters with the law, but it speaks far beyond juridical categories. So, despite my temptation, to respond to the nostalgia for an anti-intersectional past that seems so in vogue these days, I want to redouble our efforts to look back to tell the long story of how we've come to this place and how that story has to inform our present. The struggles for race, gender, and other forms of social justice, especially when it comes to the upheavals that leave ugly scars on our body politic, are always, as times move forward, conflicts over the narrative. What is the story? Who gets to tell it? What gets elevated as truth and what gets left out? All of this shapes the way we think and talk about justice for generations to come. So whether the backlash politics of today will carry forward this malignant evil into the future is the story that we're writing right here today. Intersectionality, far from being the enabler of this backlash, is a repository for untold narratives, those that shape the texture of social justice, those that embody discoveries and commitments that pull our siloed movements forward rather than something that drives them apart. We have to tell different stories, our stories. So, so in my upcoming book on intersectionality, I ground the theme not as an abstract academic undertaking, but as back talk. I call it back talk against power. So my own appetite for back talk was activated by my mom and my dad in the 70s, by feminist back talk in anti-racist spaces, by anti-racist back talk in feminist spaces, and by critical back talk in liberal legalist spaces. Back talking is part of our legacy as social justice advocates. It was said one time that the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee would talk back against a stop sign. Back talking drives our work and it underscores our sensibilities. Back talking is the story of my personal becoming political. It led me to anti racist and feminist movements, to the law, to critical race theory, and ultimately to intersectionality. So I have time to share only one story to amplify how back talking amplified for me one of the core dimensions of intersectionality, the injunction against asymmetrical alliances. Now, the moment I want to share with you uh, takes me back to law school. Um, I received an invitation of, as one of a trio of black law students had, who had formed a, a study group uh, in preparation for our final exams. And within this study group, um, there were two black men and myself. Um, one of the black men was a graduate of Harvard College and a proud member of a prestigious, formerly all-white male drinking society known as the F Club. I'm going to call it the F Club. Now, this was home to elite Harvard men, including former presidents, captains of industries, sons of wealthy families, and we were always regaled with stories about the artifacts of wealth and privilege that adorned the hall, the rituals of belonging to which he was now the first black witness. Our friend made good on a promise extended over the course of the year to visit this now fabled place, inviting us to join him for a celebratory evening as perhaps his first black guest. Now, myself and the other uh, African American were mm, cautious. We weren't entirely sure that a visit to a place where even our host was the exception was the ideal way to celebrate the law school finals. We eventually came to an agreement that we would go only under conditions that would not compromise our dignity. 
We told ourselves, and, and since we are in a civil society place, I'm gonna tell you exactly what we said. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. We said we weren't gonna take any shit from anybody at the AF Club. <laughs> and at the very first sign of trouble, we were prepared to stand our ground. So duly bonded together, we arrived at the venue and knocked at the door to announce our arrival. Our friend opened the front door, but instead of clearing the way for us to enter, he sheepishly stepped outside and cut off our path. Now, assuming that we're about to be schooled in some update uh, to the evening that included precisely the shit we weren't going to take, we assumed the trigger position. <laughs> so with arms crossed and brows furrowed, we got ready to rumble. Now, our friend, sensing that we had escalated, entreated us to relax. It's not what you think, he assured us. Updating the plan with, to him, something that was pretty minor, he simply said, I forgot to tell you that Kim is going to have to come around to the back door, he explained. Women can't enter through the front door. Well, sure enough, my friend beside me promptly disarmed. <laughs> this apparently was not the shit, at least for him, that we agreed not to take. <laughs> now, obviously for me, it was decidedly not the case that this was shit that was not part of the agreement. If the agreement not to take any shit meant anything, it was aimed at squarely whatever kind of shit stood in the way of our full entry into that institution. It mattered not a whit to me what the specific reason was that I couldn't walk through their front door. In my mind, whether it was because I was a woman or a black person made no difference to our mutual defense pact. Yet my ally seemed all too agreeable to fix what I call a sexist rider to our agreement. For him, shit clearly applied to things that we were going to be affected by in the same way, presumably. Racial exclusion of both of us would fit the bill, but the gender exclusion of me alone would not. So it was bad enough that his gendered and patriarchal interpretation of our small print within the pack extinguished any commitment that they had to me. What was worse was that they expected me to continue to hew to their reading of the agreement and to fall into line as a second-class citizen of Harvard's patriarchy. Now, apparently, for the collective reputation of black people everywhere, they rested responsibility on me not to make a scene and to comport myself as a proper guest. Respectability runs deep for people who have never had it. And who better to carry that responsibility than women? I was acutely aware that at this very moment, my brothers in struggle would want me to step back and accept the policy. And it, it, it made me frozen for that moment, realizing that they wouldn't stand up for me to be treated as their equals, and that they would judge me as a lesser sister for my standing up for myself. So the imperative of being a solid race woman who stood behind our men just rang in my head from all the times in college, law school, and elsewhere that I'd been lobbied to pledge allegiance to a flag of solidarity that never in return pledged anything to me. So. A stronger me might have bolted in that moment. I might have broken away from the expectation that I danced to this discordant tune. I might have refused to abide by this asymmetrical expectation. But that me was not me yet. That would come much later. My commitments at that moment to the notion of we, no matter what, ran deep. Perhaps I realized that there were only so many battles that anyone can wage or only so far from home anyone can roam and hope for a safe return. For whatever reason, I watch myself go back around to the back door with the consolation that they had to come to the back door with me. Now, I can't stand here tonight and tell you that partying at the F Club was something that I could never have missed. In fact, for days after that night, I wished that I had run away. 
As if to underscore the disgust of my foremothers for succumbing to such subservient conditions, whatever it was I consumed at the F Club that night made me violently ill. My head was spinning all night. My churning stomach seemed to be urging me to leave a token of my indignity all over the understated interiors of the F Club. <laughs> The war inside my body was barely containable, but I was determined to hold myself together to perform one last act of defiance that required every ounce of my physical abilities. When it was finally time to leave, my last memory of the F Club was stomping loudly down the stairs, out of the front door, and slamming it so hard that the glass in the window cracked. <laughs> Back in my dorm, I held on to my bed for fear that without gravity to hold me down, I'd be bouncing off the walls. With my spinning head, I prayed for relief, and I made a deal that I would never come close to consuming what I consumed that night, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Finally on the men, I swore never to go around to any back door ever again, whether to urge, urge to do so by an ally, urge to do so by a mentor, a friend, a lover, or even a black president. So from that moment on, I determined never to accede to the distorted notion of what respectable racial solidarity requires nor would I bend to any other form of unrequited allegiance, whether it was to colorblind feminism, American nationalism, or any political expectation that demanded fidelity in exchange for nothing. Perhaps because my humiliation that night was amplified by physical illness, this resistance to asymmetric solidarities is fully reflexive. I can't alter it. It's almost Pavlovian. I can't bring myself to believe in or agitate for trickle-down justice with a promise that some of us can wait for equal treatment and respect while the dominant members in our group, those whose oppression seems to matter most, can be attended to first. So rejecting this ritualistic marginalization of black women's legitimate expectations of communal support, I fully parted ways with allies over the expulsion of black women and our issues from narrow concepts of anti-racism. It's why I believed Desiree Washington and did not join Harlem's homecoming celebration for Mike Tyson. Is why I believed Anita Hill and did not join the chorus of African Americans praying to God to enforce her silence. It's why I declined to pack sandwiches for those men who wanted to attend the Million Man March. It's why I've criticized fellow feminists for failing to lift up survivors of sexual violence when their perpetrators are the police. It's at least as I see it why trickle down politics and wait your turn rhetorics can't exist along with a robust commitment to intersectionality. And it's also why, in the struggle of civil and human rights, we cannot submit to the demands that we just leave it all behind. The F Club has become my lodestar, my repository of determination to resist the appeal to get along and to go along. It is the encounter that navigates my thinking it disciplines my desire to be desired, to be part of the club, to be the bell of the ball. It reminds me not to ride or die for a politics that won't ride or die for me. Now, I, I confess that I say this with a determination that belies the fact that it's not always easy to stand outside. It's not always easy to refuse to go around to the black door. And sometimes when you refuse, it has had real consequences. In fact, there have been times that to stand this ground was way harder than any words can ever convey. And I here have to admit that sometimes I walk by the many F clubs in my mind's eye, the places that will celebrate and accept you on the condition that you come around to the back door. And I see a wannabe version of me 
I see someone laughing and enjoying themselves and, and flipping her straight hair and batting around with light eyes. I gaze into the window and I see that other vision of me and I feel a twinge, a momentary flight of indecision. And then I remember, the drinks in there suck anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I was like, I think. Uh, um, I would like to thank you for that talk. It was so empowering. Everybody give it up again for Professor Kimberly Kempton. So the first question I actually would like to start out out of curiosity is like you talk a lot about being a back talker, mm. which I can relate to, and I think a lot of us can relate to. Mm. Um, and within that, within always standing up for injustices that you see, my question is how do you actually like practice self-care within always having to speak up and speak out against what you say? And, and when do you know when to speak out and when you have the energy to not, right? Because I think that's also mm. something that we feel is that we always want to you know, stand up for what's right, but a lot of times it falls on the people who are the most marginalized to, to have it. to always speak out, and it's exhausting. Yeah, it is, it is. Um, it's interesting, over the last now, I guess, three years, I, I'll, I get the self-care question a lot. And the first year, I didn't have an answer at all. I was like, what's that? <laughs> what, what are you talking about? And then, and then the second year, I was like, okay, that's kind of a, um, a generational thing. Um, so I, I've got to learn what that means, right? Which is a wonderful thing, because we, you know, we old heads need to learn some stuff. Mm. And I think young folks have um, brought a lot to the table that we need to consider. So then I started saying, okay, I need to have an answer to the self-care question, because mm. it's, it's real. Um, so I would say uh, two things. Um, one, um, when, uh, when every summer I um, go to Jamaica for a month and uh, uh, have a summer camp there with like-minded people who are social justice advocates and writers. Um, it is an immersive moment where you're not the only one speaking. You're not, you know, sort of um, thinking out loud with someone who's immediately going to come and attack what you have to say. Mm. You are part of a collective that's trying to think collectively about the situation that we we are in. Mm. To me, that that is like self care. It's like. Um, you know, those exercises that they, they have us do when we're doing uh, team building where you just fall back, but most of the time we can't fall back because we're going to fall on the floor. <laughs> yeah, so drop us. So actually creating the space where you can actually fall back, um, not just emotionally, but politically, analytically. You can say, look, this is what I'm trying to think through. This is what I'm trying to create. This is what I'm trying to articulate. Having a posse that's reliable and supportive, to me, that's the most important self-care for me, right? It, it, it keeps me going. Um, now, uh, a lot of people say, okay, that, that doesn't sound like a vacation. <laughs> that sounds just like, you know, another place to do work. 
because there, I don't have a switch that turns off the thinking, that's the best I can do, and right. that really works for me. Right, that's right. your personality. That's, then that's, that's what right. it is, that's what it is. And, and, and the other thing is, um, you know, I, I really like to, I, 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 I'm an, I like to immerse myself in anything. Anything that's water related, I'm there. So like, when this is over, I'm going back to the hotel, and I'm in, you know, I'm in the tub. So these, these are the kind of things, and, and I just put as much stuff as I can find. I just throw it all in there. So I emerge, I, I immerse myself, and then I emerge, and I, I, I feel new again. So it's what I do for my body, it, for my mind, and what I do for my body. Mm, that's helpful, because you said that you, like, you have a squad. That yes. supports you. Yes. You're taking bubble baths. Yes. That yes. sounds like self-care to me. That's it. You got well, it. You know, I had to learn it. I had yeah. to learn it. I had to learn to identify that as self-care. Mm. Yeah. And I think another thing that I'm interested in is I think that every black woman has a time in her life when she realizes that you're not, like, you're not either a woman or you're not black, right? Yeah. Like, that divide yeah. of, and it's yeah. heartbreaking, actually. And I don't think that that mourning process of when you're realizing that when you speak for black people, they're not speaking for you. That's right. That's, like, its own That's experience right. in itself. How do you deal with people... I'm sure you hear it all the time, but people within your community saying what you're doing and how you're speaking is divisive. Like, what is your comeback for that? Because that's something that I hear often. And You know, um, lately, um, I think there's a great historical answer to that. So um, I was one of the um, uh, people on Anita Hill's legal team. And we got the divisive thing, you know, um, it, it, it was... It was everywhere. I mean, she couldn't go anywhere without people, you know, attacking her. And whenever I was with her, I actually experienced it. Even when we were um, at the Capitol, when um, the testimony was happening, we would go outside and would see like a bunch of black people there, you know, uh, praying and singing. And, and we thought that they had come to support her. And when we got closer to them, we realized, no, they were coming to support him. That's they were like uh, basically uh, praying for God to strike her down. Um, and so those moments like um, were just seared into my consciousness. I mean, that was what the commitment really against asymmetric solidarity came from. So the ability to, to sustain that um, was just part of what life has been like since then because um, it was so clear that there was a wrong there. But lately, um, I think history has caught up. And what I now say to people is, okay, you think I'm being divisive, but what about this? What would have happened if we had believed Anita Hill? What would have happened? Here, here's a few things that would have happened. Um, the Supreme Court that Clarence Thomas went on to sit in was the Supreme Court that gave George Bush the presidency. Ooh. George Bush gave us the war in Iraq. We wouldn't have had that without George Bush. Um, this Supreme Court struck down the Voting Rights Act in the United States. Um, Trump won by less than 100,000 votes in many states that had rules of voting that suppress black votes mm -hmm. that would not have been able to go into effect had he not been sitting on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Clarence Thomas gave us limitations on campaign finance reform. Clarence Thomas reversed affirmative. So there's like wow. a whole platform of things that are now taken as just the way things are that can be traced back to that mistaken moment. Wow. So when people say you're being divisive, what I say is, well, let's go back and look at what might have happened if this so-called divisiveness had actually been taken up by people. We wouldn't live in the world we live in today. Mm. And I think it's hard for people to think that something having to do with a black woman could actually change the history. You know? But this is one of these moments. So mm. I, I just try to tell those stories and try to lift up the history. The last thing I'll say about this is some of the folks were saying, you know, um, sexual harassment isn't a black woman's thing. It, it's not our issue. Now, aside from the fact for black women in the U.S., sexual harassment has been a condition of work life since we arrived there. Mm. It was called slavery, right? right? Um, aside from that, the reality is Rosa Parks, and someone mentioned her earlier, Rosa Parks didn't start by sitting down in a Montgomery bus. Rosa Parks started by being a rape crisis advocate for black women who were raped in the South and never were able to achieve any justice, right? So if we had been able to tell the story about 
um, anti-black racism, including women as well as men, including the, the fight against sexual abuse as well as the fight against lynching. When we got to the Clarence Thomas moment, our community wouldn't have been so divided, thinking that a commitment to anti-racism meant that they had to support him, as opposed to understanding that a commitment to anti-racism does include defending African-American women who are abused, whether it is abused by white men, brown men, or black men. Mm. So if we don't tell these stories, we will repeat the problem. So when people yeah. say you're being divisive, I'm saying, no, what I'm trying to do is make sure that the divisions that exist in our society don't continue to hobble our efforts to create a better world for all of us. Mm. And then, um, so I've, I've noticed that there's been like a resurrection of the term intersectionality. Yeah. I'm sure, like I think the younger gen generation's really taking on to it strongly and like running with it in many ways. Funny enough, the place I see it the most actually is on Tinder. A lot of people put that in their yeah, bios. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, it's such a unique... Not, not that I see it, but I, <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> yeah, and um, I, was gonna add, I was gonna ask, I mean, do you have any concerns with where you see young people taking it now or mm. are you happy with how it's going. Oh, I have many concerns. And, and I wouldn't say it's just young people. I, I, I would say, you know, intersectionality has, you know, been inhabited by any number of people with very different, you know, sort of political and, and social objectives. I mean, one of the things that I was talking about in the talk is just how, you know, the attack on intersectionality is coming from an intersectional identity. And people don't seem to think that that's a problem. I mean, it, it's in a way, um, a way of affirming how much people now think they have to do their work through through that frame. But it also, I mean, it's kind of like any other space that people of color um, have created and inhabited it. When it becomes popular, it gets gentrified. When people move in, we get pushed out. Right. Um, and so I'm seeing this with intersectionality, mm -hmm. you know, a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So um, for for a long time, I, I, my my opinion was I just write my stuff and not necessarily engage in the debate about, you know, what is or what isn't intersectionality. And to a certain extent, you know, I still think that something that has become such a global framework, you can never, you know, try to define it. But I do think that one can historicize um, different uses of it. I can historicize my own use of it. And in doing so, I can make arguments about the fact that, you know, when people take up intersectionality as feminists and they say, but we don't talk about race, to me, that's not doing intersectionality. Right. Right. Um, you know, when, when, when people talk about it as diversity, like intersectionality is diversity. I'm like, well, an institution that's committed to um, attending to intersectional forms of exclusion would probably end up being a diverse institution because they will have dealt with some of the barriers that keep particular people out of it. But it's not just another word for diversity. It's not like, oh, we're all intersectional here. Um, and a lot of people have taken it to be that. So there, there are ways in which intersectionality has been taken up that reflect a lack of engagement with any of the texts around intersectionality. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a choice, people can do it, but as someone who writes some of those texts, I can choose to, to write back. Right. And so lately, yeah, I've been doing a little bit more of that. Mm. Um, do I have time for one more question? Okay. Um, I just blanked on my question. But uh, <laughs> hold on, it was about intersectionality. Um, okay, if you had to give advice, I guess, from everybody in this room. Ooh, I hate those questions. Okay, reverse, <laughs> reverse out of that. We're gonna reverse out of that question. <laughs> um, you can ask anyone if they want. Does anybody, does anybody want to ask a question, actually? Uh, okay, yeah. There you go. There it is. 
Uh, thank you, everyone. Sarah. I'll just make it very brief. Thank you, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, my question is, um, I've been intrigued by everything I've heard. I've been out of the gender scene a bit, so this is very refreshing. Mm. But um, I work in public health, and um, I've also done community health, so I work a lot with community, you know, like more practical work. So um, if this is a movement and we want to... And because what I always find with academia is very great, but it's like everyone here is an academic, so we talk to ourselves. And sometimes the world outside doesn't quite understand us, like the people, the vulnerable people, the communities, grass, grassroots. Um, don't get to, to, to really, we speak for them, but they're like, okay, it's just like, yeah, okay, but nobody really gets it. So how can, or is there a scope to move out, to take, intersectionality or you know all these issues that we all care about to the communities to the people that are affected for them to speak it in their own language they may not call it intersectionality but if they'll call it they have a way to 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 it's like tangible like we see the change so it doesn't just stay within academia I know it's a big question but um, or maybe no, it isn't. it's not a big question it, it, and, it isn't and, but and I'm just went simplifying it so that if I was going to read to my 16 year old son um, or to my, to my, to my friend's um, um, son, who is seven, I'll find a way to simplify that language so that when he grows up, he understands it. Thank you. Yes, I appreciate that question. So um, I uh, actually think there are some real clear answers to that. It, and, and it's not like in the future. Intersectionality is in the communities. Um, it's not just an academic concept. Many people in the communities are actually using this term. So um, I think we, I think, um, so I'll give you some examples, but I also just make a cautionary tale um, about just the assumptions that ideas that are circulating in the academy are not a circulating in communities. And then in fact, weren't actually coming from community stuff because that's sometimes a critique that comes from people who aren't really paying attention to what we're doing or they oppose what we're doing and they're trying to figure out a way to discourage people from picking it up. So there's a lot of intersectional work. Um, when one of the um, publications coming out uh, next year um, does a survey of organizations and, and activists and movements that talk themselves and frame themselves as intersectional movements, right? Um, so I, I'll be talking about some of those, but even my own organization, um, Say Her Name is a movement against police violence that focuses on a group that no one talks about. That's black women. That movement involves black women who have lost their lives and their families who have, a, who have basically experienced two losses. The, the women are killed, but the fact that their daughters or mothers or sisters are killed is absolutely insignificant to people who are fighting against police violence. And it's absolutely insignificant to the broader violence against women movement. These are real people who live in communities, who actually have an issue, and none of the prevailing movements are actually addressing them. Now, those are real people. We bring them together twice a year. And when they come together twice a year, they realize that they're not alone. They thought that they were the only family that had lost a black woman to police violence, because it sure isn't on the television or the news, right? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't get on the television and news, most people think it didn't happen. And it, even if it does happen, it's not significant. So that's grassroots work, lifting up those mothers, giving them the support they need to heal, giving them the resources they need to come together on a regular basis and begin to advocate to broaden our conception of what gender-based violence looks like or to broaden our conception of what black um, anti-black racism looks like. So that's, that's, that's work that's in the community. Just about two, three weeks ago, um, we did a 15th town hall across the country in which we bring women and girls of color to, um, to the table to talk to, um, like our last one had the attorney general, 
uh, from the state we were in, the person who runs the Board of Education, the person who runs public housing, the person you know who basically uh, runs the jails, for them just to sit there and listen to what women and girls of color are actually saying to them about the shape of their lives. And, and when we say women and girls of color, we mean across the board. We mean anyone and everyone who identifies um, as a woman or girl of cover, color or gender nonconforming person. And many a time, they are talking about issues that anti-racism doesn't talk about very well, or feminists don't talk about uh, very well, or LGBTQ discourses won't talk about very well. They know that they're talking about stuff that comes that falls between the cracks, and they realize that the move forward requires their voices to have this platform. So, so that's the kind of work that we do. It's not just you know, sitting in the academy. And there are a lot of people who do that work in partnership. So um, I think it's important to, to recognize that there are resources that are there. If we want to talk about how to tell the new generation, our youngins, how to do this work, there are people who are doing it. So the CIJ, that's a place where, you know, um, young folks can go and learn more uh, about intersectional work. And then there are just a lot of other um, ways in which traditional movements have have a dimension of it that really is intersectional. Our, our challenge is figuring out how to lift them up, how to make sure they get adequately resourced, how to make sure that the work that they bring to the table allows them to build institutions rather than institutions building themselves off of their backs. That, that's frankly the challenge right now. Thank you for that great question. Um, and I would like to thank you for being here. And I really feel like with your all the work that you do, the one thing I think everyone would agree with me is that you can feel the love that you have within thank your work. And the fact that you, I can tell you genuinely want to make change, and you are making change. And we really appreciate you. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> OK. So I feel like, are we taking a picture? Oh, music. Sorry. Ah, OK. The classical music again. Oh, yes, y'all. Yes. Come on. OK, again for the classical music. This is amazing. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I need y'all to play at my wedding when I get married one day. <laughs> Sorry, okay, I just want to also say the composer who you guys were playing before, her name is Florence Price, who's an African-American composer from the 19th century. Okay.
Not yet. time for the big picture who made it all possible this big event and of course first of all thank you Maya so so much <laughs> thank you to, to our three power talks please come on stage yes You have been so good. Come on stage. Oh, yeah. Ed is coming. Then, of course, there are teams behind. Please, the team of, of um, OK, I think Emilia and Miriam, they are still somewhere out. But the team of the Center for Intersectional Justice, please come here or come here a little later. <laughs> The team of Funda Werner Miriam, Institute. Miriam, Miriam come, come, come. Come up the stage. Woo. The team of Funda Werner Institute, please come on stage. Hannah, where are you? And a special thank you to Eva Klakel, who is, uh, who is the head of the conference team here. And she made all this environment Eva, pass. Eva, Eva, please come up. <laughs> Hannah, come up. A big, big, big thank you again to you translators. You were working like crazy. <laughs> Also in the back, thank you so much. Thank you to the technique. And and now it's time to party. The uh, books, the books. Ah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so on the way to the party, on your way down. Please feel invited to grab a book, because downstairs, the homies, DJs, they are waiting for you. And then we will have all a glass together, I hope. And let's party. And thank you again for yes, being they're here. They're and now they are coming, finally. <laughs> Yeah. And in this stage, I would like to really thank uh, CIJ's team and especially my dear colleague Miriam, who is, I mean, we are the dream team together and this is so wonderful to, yeah, to just have our daily life at CIJ and pull up all those projects. So yeah, thank you so much. And also thank you to our interns. Thank you to Knock for doing the live streaming. To all the past interns, to Lynn, to Didian, to all of you, to Sienna for Fenya, sorry, Fenya, uh, for helping out uh, today. Thank you so much. Woo!